Hi, I'm Jade and I'm a medical student in Leicester. In today's video, we will cover child and adolescent psychiatry in a nutshell. Big thank you to Dr. Khalid Karim, who's a child and adolescent psychiatrist at LPT. So let's begin. Many anxiety disorders are common in children just like they are in adults. Children can have generalized anxiety disorders, although the somatic manifestations like abdominal pain, nausea, sweating, and palpitations are more prominent in children. They can have phobic disorders too. Keep in mind that it is normal for children of preschool age to have specific fears and phobias, which self-resolve. It's when these phobias persist that it becomes pathological. OCD, which is characterized by obsessive thoughts and compulsive actions, can occur in children. It can be harder to elicit obsessive thoughts from the history in children than in adults, however. Post-traumatic stress disorder can occur in children, and it is characterized by the persistent remembering or reliving of trauma, avoidance of similar situations associated with the previous event or stressor, and increased arousal. One anxiety disorder unique to children is separation anxiety. Separation anxiety is normal from six months to three years, but abnormal if it persists beyond the age of three. It describes when anxiety manifests solely on separation from attachment figures and resolves when their primary carer is around. Children can present with physical symptoms of anxiety, including abdominal pain and bedwetting, but also with school refusal or vivid nightmares of separation. Anxiety disorders in children, if mild, can be managed at home. Signpost patients to the Young Minds website, as well as Anxiety UK, which are self-help and educational resources for parents and children. Meditation and mindfulness can be beneficial. Cognitive behavioral therapy can be used to help the patient explore and understand their emotions and to learn practical techniques to reduce feelings of anxiety. Behavioral therapy like systematic desensitization, flooding and response prevention can sometimes be used. Medication can be used as a last resort. SSRIs are given first line for anxiety. Now let's move on to mood disorders. Depression can occur in children and it is characterized by low mood and anhedonia. The low mood is persistent but not always pervasive in children. Also, low energy and other biological symptoms are not reliable symptoms for depression in children. Depression is treated by managing underlying problems, signposting to self-help groups and websites, CBT, and if necessary, the first line pharmacological treatment is fluoxetine, which is an SSRI. Now let's move on to behavioral disorders. Conduct disorder is defined as a repetitive and prolonged pattern of antisocial behaviors, which are outside social norms. In conduct disorder, there is persistent, repetitive, and severe antisocial behavior outside the home. There are two subtypes of conduct disorder, socialized and unsocialized. Socialized is less serious, it's phasic, and the child often shares their antisocial behaviors like truancy from school and stealing with their peer groups. Unsocialized is more serious because it leads to criminality and antisocial personality disorder eventually. These children tend to be rejected by their peer group. Risk factors for conduct disorders include lack of clear boundaries, rejection, family conflict, child abuse, comorbid learning disabilities or learning difficulties, and neurodevelopmental conditions. 50% of children with ADHD have conduct disorder too. Before a diagnosis of a conduct disorder can be made, other mental conditions like depression, ADHD, and ASD should be ruled out. Conduct disorders are managed by ensuring consistent care and parenting, school-based interventions like counseling at school, community talking therapy like Let's Talk, and behavioral therapy. Oppositional defiant disorder occurs in younger children and is characterized by defiance, mild aggression, disobedience, and disruptive behavior. ODD is managed with behavioral therapy and parental training. Next, let's move on to neurodevelopmental conditions. Three to 5% of children in the UK have ADHD, and in two thirds of cases, it's said to persist into adulthood. It affects more males than females. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder is a behavioral disorder that includes symptoms like inattentiveness, which can manifest as forgetfulness, losing things regularly, avoiding activities that require focus and being highly distractible, 
Hyperactivity, where the child appears restless, fidgeting a lot, talking too much and too loudly. And impulsiveness, which means that children often interrupt or blurt out answers, disobey, throw regular temper tantrums and have difficulty waiting their turn. Risk factors for ADHD include family history, being male and parental use of cannabis. For a diagnosis of ADHD to be made, the symptoms must have been present for at least six months and occur in more than one environment. The diagnosis is based on history and observation in different settings. A child under six cannot be diagnosed with ADHD. Mild to moderate ADHD is managed with parenting and school interventions, CBT and social skills training, alongside self-help and support groups like Add Up. Comorbid psychiatric disorders like anxiety and depression should be treated. The first line treatment for severe ADHD is medication. Methylphenidate, which is a CNS stimulant, is used first line. Side effects of methylphenidate include growth retardation, loss of appetite, insomnia, and hypertension. 1% of all children in the UK are on the autistic spectrum. Autistic spectrum disorder is characterized by a triad of symptoms. Social interaction difficulties. This can present as reduced social gestures, reduced eye contact, reduced interest in others, and reduced awareness of social rules like personal space. Communication difficulties, which can present as delayed speech or repetition of words. And restricted stereotyped interests and behaviours, like rocking, twisting, upset by changes in routine. Patients don't like to experiment with different foods, clothes, games, and they may obsessively pursue interests. The symptoms must have started before the age of three, and the symptoms must be present in more than one environment for a diagnosis to be made. The diagnosis is made based on a thorough history, clinical observation and assessment using standardised tools like ADOS to get a better idea of the patient's function, strengths and weaknesses. Risk factors for autistic spectrum disorder include maternal age over 40, maternal use of sodium valparate while pregnant, obstetric complications like hypoxia during childbirth, being male, family history of autistic spectrum disorders or psychiatric disorders, and prematurity. You may have heard of Asperger's, which comes under ASD in the ICD-11 and is considered part of the spectrum. Patients with Asperger's have the triad of symptoms that characterize autism, but there is no impairment in language, cognition, or intelligence. Patients with ASD are managed in the community by an MDT, including a pediatrician, key worker, psychiatrist, educational psychologist, speech and language therapist, and occupational therapist. There is no cure for autistic spectrum disorder, but some management options are psychoeducation for family or carers, stress reduction for the patient, CBT, interventions for life skills, special schooling, self-help groups like NAS, treat comorbidities like anxiety, and melatonin can be prescribed for resistant sleep problems. Antipsychotics can also be given for challenging behaviour when psychosocial interventions are insufficient and features are severe. Eating disorders are rare in pre-adolescence but often occur in young adults. In fact, there's an increasing prevalence. Young people with anorexia nervosa and bulimia present similarly to adults, with the primary feature of anorexia being calorie restriction and the primary feature of bulimia being binging. Eating disorders are particularly dangerous in childhood and adolescence due to the risk of delayed puberty and growth. Treatment is with family intervention therapy and signposting to self-help groups and educational resources. An intellectual disability refers to restrictions a child has within an area of their learning development like literacy, numeracy, non-verbal or verbal reasoning, memory or just generally. For an intellectual disability to be diagnosed, a triad of features must be present. A low intellectual performance, that is IQ less than 70. Symptom onset must be at birth or early childhood. And there must be a wide range of functional impairment due to reduced ability to acquire adaptive skills. Often no cause for intellectual disability is found, but some possible causes include genetic conditions, neonatal complications, abuse, neglect, and lack of mental stimulation. To diagnose intellectual disabilities, first the clinician should take a thorough history. Then they must rule out developmental disorders and genetic conditions. 
Next, an educational psychologist will assess the intellectual performance using the IQ test. Intellectual disabilities are managed by formulating an individual education plan, where specific targets are set based on the patient's capabilities. Special schooling or SENCO support at school can help support people with IDs to attain life skills and in some cases qualifications. Social support and family education are both also essential in the management plan. Do you know the difference between a learning disability and a learning difficulty? A learning difficulty does not affect general intelligence, whereas a learning disability is linked to an overall cognitive impairment. Some examples of specific learning difficulties are dyspraxia and dyslexia. Thanks for watching.